All right. Juliana, Rushi, Banzi, are you there? We are all good to start. Welcome, ladies. Hello. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and happy spring. Welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy and Peel Psychology's Therapy Centers collaborative webinar, Healing with Nature and Turtles. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. I want to say a special thanks today to Credit Valley Conservation for supporting the Riverwood Conservancy webinars and other programs that we put on. Before we get to today's or this evening's presentation, we have a couple housekeeping notes. You can now book a personalized presentation or activity like trivia nights for your club, community group, or business through the riverwoodconservancy.org slash virtual discovery or book a virtual school program at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash virtual education. Our other free webinars for the month of March and April are live on our events page, so please register for those as well. And if you have the financial means today to support our programming and conservation at Riverwood, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org. And Peel Psychology and Therapy Center have monthly meditation through art workshops, which are amazing. The next one is coming up on April 30th at 6.30 p.m. And you can email info at peelpsychology.com to register for this. And today we have three wonderful speakers from Peel Psychology and Therapy Center. And I will hand it over to each one of them to introduce themselves. So Juliana, if you want to go first. Hi everyone, I'm Juliana. I'm a student at Peel Psychology and Therapy Center. Here at Peel Psychology and Therapy Center, we offer, we offer counseling services. We have psychologists, psychotherapists, and social workers. A variety of them speak different languages and they, they work with different age groups. I'm Juliana and I uh, study addictions and mental health. And I just completed my placement with Peel Psychology. So hi everyone, my name is Fancy. So I am also um, from Peel Psychology. And so I'm currently doing my placement at Peel Psychology and I'm in my final semester at the University of Toronto finishing my degree in biology and psychology. I am Arushi, I am a Master of Social Work student from the University of Western Ontario. And I've been with Peel Psych for about three years now. Wonderful. And everyone can see my screen okay, right? Yep. It's just my PowerPoint showing. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, before we get to today's presentation, we would just like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee nations. Um, we're very grateful to be able to work on this land. Now, I will be doing a visualization virtual walk right now. Um, it's a quick story time to kind of set the tone for the webinar today. And this is actually inspired by a colleague of mine, Carrie Pruneau, who is wonderful at leading um, virtual and re relaxing walks. Um, so I want everyone to get into a comfortable position. And if you want, you can close your eyes if you so choose, or you can watch the screen as I'm going to be showing some images as well. One second. So imagine you're going for a walk along Vernon Thorpe Road when you come to a bridge. You decide to look over the bridge and find a huge plot of land occupied with trees and separated by a winding river. <laughs> You are curious, so you walk in to find yourself at a place called Riverwood. Standing in the middle of McEwen Terrace Gardens, you look towards the start of the trail that winds a path into the forest. As you smell the fresh scent of pine trees mixed with melting snow and soil, a small brown leaf flutters past your head, or so you thought. You look to the ground to see a tiny butterfly that has just awoken from a long winter under the snow. You startle the butterfly as you approach it, and it continues high into the sky until unrecognizable. Everything is moving so quickly, but you choose to slow your breathing, close your eyes, and raise your nose to the warm spring sun. Gradually, you make your way to the start of the yellow trail. 
The feeder is bursting with seed that attracts a wide variety of birds of all different colors and sizes. You notice a blackbird with a startling red wing caps perched on the branch of a maple tree. What bird is this, you think to yourself? You wait patiently and quietly as it sits on the branch. It puffs up its wings and calls. It seems that the whole forest has gone quiet listening to this flashy bird. You continue down the trail to discover more about this place called Riverwood. You start to feel eyes on you. It seems as though something is following you. You look up the tra to trail to the tall trees to see little black and white birds looking down at you. Three, four, five, six. There's six of them following you closely behind in search of food. It is clear now that these birds are used to visitors sharing some healthy sunflower seeds with them. The trail ahead begins to get muddy as you travel downhill. The squishy soil beneath your feet is refreshing to the often hard and cold concrete of the sidewalk. You hear rustling coming from the tall grasses that have sprung up after being smothered by snow all winter. You stop and go quiet, waiting for something to rustle again. You see it. It's a small rabbit perfectly camouflaging into its surroundings. It seems to know that you are no threat and continues to graze on the grass. The rest of your walk was in complete silence. A small caterpillar with dark colors is there to warm itself in the sunshine and it crawls quietly along the path. Across the way, reaching far into the distance, is a great blue heron who just migrated back to its breeding grounds for the summer. Its wings as it flies are silent. Finally, you reach the river you have seen at the top of the bridge. It seems much larger and fast moving as you approach closer. You sit there for a while on the rocky shoreline and listen to the sound of the gurgling river. We'd like to ask you to visit Riverwood as if you were a turtle. Slow moving, enjoying and basking in the warm sunshine, listening for sounds in the forest, and never leaving a trace that you were ever there. So I wanna thank everyone for joining me on a little virtual walk before we get started. And hopefully that relaxed everyone now. Girls, are you feeling relaxed? <laughs> um, I'm gonna hand it off now to Banzi and Juliana who are gonna lead the, the rest of this part of the workshop. Thank you, everyone. One second, and I will share the slide. Sorry, network issues. <laughs> Don't be sorry. We all understand network issues right now. <laughs> Especially right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, just give me one second. There we go. Okay. So, you know, before I've kind of opened the question to all of the participants that we have joining with us, you know, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, COVID-19 has had a huge impact in everyone's lives, right? whether that's through our social support, you know, whether that's our, the way we interact with our social support, right? Everything has been challenged, right? The way we used to interact with our peers before may not be the same way we do so now. For instance, like the way I, I used to meet up with my friends, you know, outside my campus. But unfortunately, because of COVID restrictions, I now rely on Zoom to talk to them. So, you know, maybe does someone in the comments want to share how COVID-19 has impacted their social support? you know, maybe just a few words, the way it has. And Arushi or Juliana, can one of you let me know? Because unfortunately, I can't see the comments when I do screen share. So if you guys can just, one of you just mention it. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe, do you guys maybe want to start opening the floor? Like how has COVID-19 affected your social support? Like we can start with Stephanie and then we can have participants joining in. Yeah. Um... I think everyone can relate to it being very difficult, not being able to see people in person and everything is now done over virtual means. I mean, even given us four, we've worked together for 
I don't know how many months now doing different kind of workshops and we've never met in person. And what we keep talking about is wanting to meet on site in nature and meet each other in person. So um, it's definitely been difficult. Are we getting any comments, Arushi or Juliana? Yeah, we have a comment here in the chat or I'm not being able to see family, especially over the holidays, which I'm That's sure- very true. No, yeah. we, we've, um, you know, uh, do our holidays now is so different, like Christmas, you know, Valentine's Day, and so many more, like even Easter, right? Like it's, it's, there's been a, a change, right? And it, it's been difficult that we can't not say that it's not been difficult, regardless of, you know, if you've had family members who've been directly impacted by COVID or not, it has had a huge impact. What about you, Arushi or Juliana? Does one of you guys want to share? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of patterns here. A lot of people oh, are- right. Uh, you know, haven't been able to see family, um, holidays, get-togethers, even just going out for a quick break, mm -hmm. not being able to go on vacation, family and friends, not being able to see the world. I I'm think all of you guys are touching on key components that we're going to be talking yeah. about throughout the presentation. And thank you all so much for sharing. I'm, unfortunately, I can't see the comments directly, so, but I'm sure all of you guys, put, you know, wrote down very key components. So I'm going to trans... Now move it to Juliana, who's going to talk about other aspects. So here I'm going to talk about the importance of social connections to humans. So I'm going to open up to you guys. Why do you guys think it is so important for humans to have social connections? And while we wait for um, some of our participants to respond to that, what do you guys think? Um, I personally think it's because, you know, when you are able to connect with someone, you're able to kind of understand where they're coming from. You know, you have a lot more experience to share, right? You gain a lot of experience as well, regardless if it's, you know, and like it's for a specific job or for, for whatever reason, you do gain some sort of knowledge. Yep, definitely. You're gaining knowledge, you're learning, you, you take things from people, right? I'm seeing here empathy, feelings, touch, interactions, emotions, connectivity. Let's see here. We can use different feelings through friends and family to put into perspective. So exactly getting perspectives from different people. You're always learning. Again, learning about yourself and others, sharing experiences, knowing you're not alone and how you feel. Yes, these are all really, really great points. Um, and just to continue on this while I wait for some more hugs, hugs is a big one. And I know we all miss our hugs right now due to COVID. We're not getting as many of those hugs as we want, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll get some turtle hugs later in this uh, webinar. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope so. Um, but yeah, having a so strong social connection can have many benefits to us uh, as humans, as individuals. Um, we're getting more missing grandchildren and their hugs, of course. Um, having this social connection can help to lower symptoms of anxiety and depression. It can help to regulate our emotions. It helps to improve our self-esteem and empathy. And we saw empathy, Judy said earlier, empathy, that's a big one as well. It can also strengthen our resilience. Uh, our resilience, our ability to get back up after difficult situations. And Alice from uh, Facebook actually said it improves your immune system too. Yes, it yeah. definitely does, right? Connections with humans. It also can have a benefit on the immune system as well. Um, humans have adapted the importance of social connections through evolution by incorporating in the way we communicate. So I know a couple of people said up here, let's see your feelings, touch, connectivity, all those sorts of things, but it really involves our key senses. So we use the tone of our voice to communicate, right? L louder, softer, different uh, tones and pitches. We use our facial expressions to read each other. So we, we use our eyes or mouth, right? The way we're use moving our jaw muscles to read information from each other. Also, what was a common theme from from everyone saying, we miss the, it's the sense of touch, that a slight touch can do wonders on the body. You might not realize it in the moment, but like just a tap on the shoulder, that's 
that's going to send stimulation to your brain. That's going to going to affect our social connection. And touch is a very, very big one. The power of touch actually releases oxytocin, which is a hormone that makes you feel good. Oops, one second. Yeah, so it makes you feel good. So just try to imagine right now, when's the last time you gave someone a big hug, not even just a, or a little tap, you can, you really feel like at that tingling sensation you get or that acknowledgement, that's what the social connection brings. And it starts to release those oxytocin hormones and you start to feel good in general. Humans also have a drive to belong, be accepted and connect with others. Um, we have what's known as a social brain. So I'm not going to go too scientific here, but our neocortex in our brain is much larger in humans than it is in other animals. And this region involves lots of social connections. So, so we do have other mammals that, um, that have strong social connection, like uh, rodents, elephants, or turtles that are coming up. But humans, we have this really big region in our brain that um, impacts, uh, that's developed for the importance of social connections. Ooh. Sorry, just give me one second. I think my PowerPoint just shut off. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Network oh, issues are... Sorry. Don't be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> our computers are so overwhelmed with how many things we have open all the time so yeah. we understand <laughs> can everyone see yeah, this you're good. we're perfect. good okay perfect. perfect sorry continue juliana yeah. oh that yeah we can move on to the next one that one's perfect. good now i'm going to talk about um we have our social support we want to know uh, the different types of relationships so we know that humans are very social creatures you know we've evolved to be social creatures and relationships can take many different forms. Now, I wanna hear again from everyone, what are some different forms of relationships that we know of? So, colleagues, yep, that's a good one. What else do we got? Friends, family, romantic, friends, close, casual, family, parents. We're seeing lots of acquaintances, yep. Strangers, close friends. close friends. We're seeing lots of the same. We're seeing family, friends, those seem to be very important ones. So neighbors, yep, neighbors as well. So we see parents, siblings, extended family, friends, coworkers. Those are kind of the, the ones that pop into our head, but I wanna just, put out there some other ones that we may not really think of in the, mo in the moment. Pets there, Lisa's pets, classmates, recreation teammates. Yes, those are all great ones. Strangers again, yep. Animals, amazing. So yes, animals are a big one. Our classmates are a big one. We have spiritual relationships or pets, volunteering, clubs that you're in, right? We also have our doctors, our doctors that we associate, postmen, right? Our community, we're seeing a lot of things here that involve our community, right? We also have the connection with nature. Nature is very important. Nature, nature also helps to stimulate all of our senses in our brain. And we also have the relationships with ourselves. Now, I want us to keep in mind that not everyone has access to all these different types of relationships, and it's important to be aware of this. However, some people may have access to only family and friends. Some people might not. Some people may not have access to the community. But as we just saw, the list goes on and on uh, of all the different types of relationships that we can form, even when we're in situations when we may not have some of those main ones. So just because we don't have one access to one or two types of these relationships doesn't mean we can't build a strong social connection. Everyone's social connection is different. However, many people don't realize that, that they are all effective ways to build a social connection. So people may be a little bit more introverted, a little more extroverted, um, but at least we can be aware of all these different uh, types of relationships that are available to us. So 
Again, I wasn't expecting people to say pets, but we did get pets there. <laughs> pets are a very important one. Um, you know, just the touch of pets, the love of pets, little furry things, all sorts of pets, reptiles, you know, spiders even. <laughs> um, they all bring some sort of joy to us and it, it helps us bring, uh, it's, a, it's a form of a relationship. It may not be a human connection, but it is a type of a connection. There, again, I'm going to bring up the connection with nature just to go outside and breathe in some of that fresh air, to feel the sun in your face, to feel the grass. It can be very nurturing. So your connection with nature can also um, produce a really strong, important uh, social connection. Now, lastly, uh, I, I wanted to say we also have the importance of having uh, a, a relationship or a connection with yourself. And I'm not going to get into too much of that. So um, Bansi's going to take that one over. Perfect. So Juliana, first of all, thank you so much for enlightening us on all the different types of relationships we have, right? Regardless, you know, it's with your friends, your family, any type of relationship you have with someone from the outside works, right? And, and the fact that, you know, everyone, like Juliana said, the relationships for everyone change, right? Not everyone has the same relationships and maybe someone does and people do, but it, it means different things for different people. However, the main thing you, everyone should, you know, I think take away is the fact that, you know, the relationship with yourself, but you know, what does it mean to have a good relationship with yourself? You know, well, it means not trying to change the way we live our lives for other people. You know, it means letting go of the feelings that we have to be someone else we are not just for someone else. It means, you know, accepting our mistakes. It means acknowledging our joys, acknowledging our good things we've done, right? Not, it's not always about just criticizing ourselves, right? We are, you know, there's a really important saying that I've heard throughout my life is that we are our harshest critics, right? And I'm sure Juliana, Arushi, Stephanie, you guys can all agree with me that sometimes when we don't get the things we want, we're extremely harsh on ourselves. And we have to remember that you have to accept yourself for the way you are, right? If you're, if you are criticizing yourself for when you don't achieve something or just, un, you know, in some situations, you should also acknowledge when you do achieve good things, right? You need to give yourself a little break. You need to say that I'm proud of myself for doing whatever I've been able to achieve, right? It, it, and, and this, and this, all of this falls under something called self-care. I'm sure everyone knows what that term means. But self-care in general is looking after yourself and your own mental health, you know, whether that's physically or mentally. And sometimes there's that common notion where that self-care is just about looking after yourself physically, or it's just looking after yourself mentally. No, it's both, right? Self-care can be anything that you would like to do, right? The relationship you have with yourself is extremely crucial to your own well-being and the relationship you have with others, right? I think one of the most, my favorite quotes is that caring for myself is not a self-indulgence. It's a self-preservation, right? The relationship you have with yourself and the positive outlook or the outlook you have on yourself is going to impact the way you have the is going to impact the way you look at other people and the relationships you have with other people, right? Juliana touched upon so many types of different relationships uh, we have. And all of you also suggested so many other things in the comments, right? And, and the main thing is that, you know, self-care can look like different things for different people, right? Um, I want to actually hear from all of you guys in the comments, you know, how, like, what is one self-care activity that you guys all like to do? Maybe I can start this one. Um, one thing I like to do is that when, when it's a really hectic week, I will shut off my computer, I will shut off all of my devices and just, you know, sit by my bed and read a book. Or I will go outside, weather permitting. What about um, anyone else? Juliana, do you want to start sharing? And then I will look at the comments to see if we get some. Yeah, I like going for walks with my dogs. Um, I like nature. I like bugs. So I'm that crazy bug lady that likes to go find bugs. <laughs> nice amazing bird watching Love oh yes we see a few comments bird watching i like spending time outdoors bubble bath yes that's a really good one <laughs> cycling hiking kayaking yes watching a comedy before bed yes that is also something i like to do meditation going outside bubble bath <laughs> yes reading meditation and I'm, and I'm seeing kind of like a trend right everyone there's a lot of comments about going outside connecting with nature of course, that is some that is a main aspect that we're trying to touch on our in our presentation too, right? Listening to music is also another great one. But 
what about in situations where you're indoors, right? COVID has had a huge impact in how we connect with people outside, right? There have been restrictions. We are not able to go outside as we were maybe before. So how do you relax or how is how has your self-care moderated, you know, with COVID? Maybe if someone can share, a, maybe a different or unique way we, you guys do something? Um, I can I can share. Uh, I'm actually sure. connecting back to somebody that said bird watching. Margaret said bird watching um, in the yeah. chat, and um, bird watching is something that's really accessible from indoors and outdoors, and it's why it's so great. And I think like if you are stuck indoors, you can still bird watch from your window. And I've noticed even this week, I am so much happier this week and just like excited <laughs> to work and do everything. And I have so much energy and I noticed it's because birds are back and <laughs> they're singing yeah, and there's noises and um, going outside or from my window watching birds. That's something that really... Um, of course, of course. And it's energy. amazing other comments where my indoor plant family has grown. Yes, yes. That's <laughs> so, always amazing. Um, and I think there was one comment, um, I think it was by Vanessa, who said that her self-care has gone a little bit more better because she, you know, has less commute and less and, you know, more time for herself. That's that's actually a really great point that I wanted to touch on afterwards, too. That self-care, just because, you know, we're stuck indoors, we're stuck, you know, just with our family or we're stuck with just one person or however many people you live with, maybe we don't get to go outside, excluding, you know, for like important things like grocery or like medication, you know, so it's just been so limited. We've been so constricted. And like Juliana said, you know, we are humans, are social at creatures right we interact socially we learn socially right and exactly yes there was another few comments eating more healthy food because i've been cooking at home exactly right self-care doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be something sedentary right you don't have to just sit in one spot and be doing something self-care can be just you know walking down the stairs or you know cooking right all of these are great ideas and i think all of you guys are touching on the main component that self-care do doesn't have to stop as soon as we're restricted from outside, or it doesn't stop as soon as we're restricted on the inside, right? Self-care can be moderated, can be changed however you want it to. It doesn't have to look at look the same for, you know, everyone. Like the way Stephanie probably self-cares is probably not the same way I do. Now, does that mean that it's wrong? Of course not. The way you do it is the way, you know, may, whatever makes you comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a perfect time to start a activity that we have ongoing, which Arushi is going to get into. But just remember everyone, you know, we've talked about support. We've talked about the relationship you have with others, so yourself, everything is important and you just have to take it one step at a time. So, yeah, Arushi, give it a go. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you ladies for all the information and for the nature walk. Um, so before we get started with the activity, I'd like everyone to take a moment to silently reflect. And when was the last time you picked up a paintbrush, a coloring tool, any other art tool you might have in the home? And maybe it's been a while, maybe it hasn't, given that we're all at home. <laughs> when was, oh, this morning. That makes me happy to hear that. <laughs> it's awesome. And for many of us, including myself, when I think of art, it feels a little bit intimidating because I know where my skills lie and it's unfortunately not in art. But I think there is a lot more to art beyond being good at it or feeling like you're creative. And I think in general, with creativity and art, allowing our brains the freedom for some self-expression, even through doodling, can have a great impact on how we process, retain, and share information. So today we'll be doing an arts-based practice. So I wanted to give you all a little bit more information about that. So the goal of an arts-based practice is to produce some artistic outcome from turning inwards. The arts can offer unique perspectives, approaches, and tools to meaningly and effectively engage ourselves and others through creative expression. And when words fail, the arts can open a back door to our mind and allow us to draw from things that we may struggle to put into words. And I personally think that's a great way to celebrate strength, creativity, and diversity through creative expression. So if we can move on to the next slide, you'll see a little skeleton here of a turtle. So I don't know if some of you have this printed out or would like to kind of draw your own version of it. I will leave that completely open to you all. And through this turtle activity, we will have some time for self-reflection, slowing down and practicing gratitude. 
So feel free to use a variety of colors, writing tools during this time, whatever feels right. And then just a regular pen and pencil, which is what I'll be opting for today. And during this activity, I'd like you all to reflect on how you're feeling. And if any new feelings come up, positive, not so positive, all thoughts and feelings are absolutely welcome here. And please feel free to share anything that comes up in the chat. Oh, All right. everyone. All righty, so moving on to the next slide. If we could all start off by writing your name in the middle of the turtle shell. And around this, please write three things about yourself that make up your identity. So in my case, I might write something like, I enjoy going for walks, I like playing the piano, and a little bit more boring, I'm a graduate student. <laughs> and of course, people's identities and personalities are made up of a ton of different things. But for today, we'll list down three things and I will give you all a minute to do that and I'll play some music in the background while you all go ahead. everyone. I hope a minute was enough time for that prompt. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Sorry, Fancy, would you mind moving over to the next slide? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Network. Oh, no worries. I know, I know you're manning the chat as well right now, so thank you for that. No problem. All righty. So around these parts of our identity, I'd like you all to also write down five things that you like about yourself. So these can be things that you like about yourself, positive traits other people have pointed out, anything that comes to mind. And I'll give you all another moment to do that. I think for a little bit longer, if it's okay with everyone, we'll just keep this turtle up here on screen so we all kind of have something to look at as we continue to write. So next up, if we could all write down five people that we feel loved or supported by and who you also love and support. And this could even be a pet, as we kind of chatted about earlier. And as you write down these names, I'd like you all to take a moment to reflect on why these people or creatures make you feel loved and supported, especially in the hard times. We'll give you all a minute to do that now as well.
Alrighty, everyone. So now, Nancy, if we can move to the slide about the activities that bring some joy. So I think it's right after this one. Awesome. So if we could continue to draw on our shell, if we could write down five activities that bring you joy, whether it's new activities that you had the chance to try this year due to more time at home, or even old activities that might have brought you comfort during some uncertain times. And I'd like to think that we could even write down activities that we hadn't had a chance to try yet, but you know that it could bring you joy. And as you write down these activities, I invite you to reflect on what makes these activities joyful and a good experience. Alrighty, everyone. For our fourth prompt, if you could all write down five places that bring you joy, whether it's places you've been to, places you wish to go to. I know we, uh, we chatted a little bit about not being able to travel, so this is your chance to write down where you plan on going afterwards <laughs> when we're all able to do so, or even imaginary places. There are no limits at all here. I'll give you all some time to jot those down now. that was enough time and moving on to the last prompt. I'd like to end off this exercise by writing down five things that have been on your mind to just lighten the load on your mind, put it on paper, anywhere other than up here. And use it as an opportunity to release some stress, maybe write down something positive like an affirmation that's been on your mind, whatever you feel like, just get it out on paper. Mm -hmm. 
everyone. I hope that was enough time and if it wasn't you can definitely feel free to continue this activity after the workshop. So if there's one thing I'd like you all to take away from this experience is that art and writing as a method to relax and practice gratitude can be used by absolutely anyone. There is no prerequisite of artistic skill and the more you tap into your creative process the more comfortable you'll feel with how you choose to express yourself. Now I can see the chat a little bit better now. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or reflections that they'd like to share? I will open the chat up now. Something with turtles. That sounds awesome. Oh, Steph, that looks so good. <laughs> I don't think it looks very good. That looks That's awesome. Okay. It, looks so good. it looks so good. It has a little party hat on too, everyone. <laughs> Awesome. So if you were worried about drawing your own turtle, don't worry, mine is probably worse. <laughs> thank you so much, Arushi. That was wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you all for participating. And I will pass it over to Stephanie for some turtle time. Um, that was very relaxing, Arushi, and I really liked that activity, and I might steal that activity, because um, <laughs> it was great. That was really relaxing. Um, Stephanie, sorry, before you start, I'm going to stop sharing so that we get the huge screen to see all of the amazing turtles. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you. Great presentation, so relaxing, and it's really nice to, to be able to speak to other people about this because I think we're all feeling a little bit isolated. Um, so just kind of to end off the webinar, we are going to be showing you some turtles. Um, just as a little added bonus to the webinar, uh, we have some turtle friends here today and um, they may not be in your room with you, but um, it's a little connection to nature uh, and hopefully it relaxes you even more today and makes you feel a little bit happier. So here at Riverwood, we have five pet turtles. Um, this here is Almira. I'll put her up really close to um, the screen. And if you have any questions about turtles today, please just type them in the chat or the Q&A bar and we'll get to them right away. I kind of want it to be a more open discussion about the turtles, um, but I'll start it off anyways. So this one is Almira. She's our smallest turtle friend. She's often very shy, but lately, she's been coming out of her shell literally more <laughs> as you can see she's trying to walk around right now and she is the smallest she is a very healthy little turtle she loves to eat her veggies she always eats veggies she's really good with it some of the other turtles aren't as great with it um, as you can see behind me we have a couple other turtles in the tank 
Um, we have the biggest one at the back there, which is Lady, and she is the oldest as well. She's about 40 years old. Um, and then we have Sammy right here swimming right there. She has a very bumpy shell. Um, when she was little, she ate too much protein. So all of these turtles are actually adoptees. We adopted them all. And then the last turtle we have right here, this is uh, Lou. And then we have another turtle tank across the room that has Shelly in it. And Shelly's a little bit grumpy. Um, so all of our turtle friends have different personalities, just like us. And um, they all need, they all eat different foods. Well, not completely different foods, but they all like different foods and they all have different personalities. So Shelly actually has to have her own tank because she is, um, a little bit of an introvert. She doesn't want to be with the other turtles. Um, I see Barbara in the chat is asking what kind of turtles they are. These are called red-eared sliders. They're called red-eared sliders. Let me see, the lighting's a little bit bad right now. But if you can see just along where her head is, she's now tucking her head into her shell. Um, but if she comes out of her shell a little bit more, you can see a little red mark on the side of her head. And that's why she's called a red-eared slider. Now, the red-eared sliders are not supposed to live in Ontario. We have about eight species of turtles here in Ontario, and they're all struggling. They all really need help, especially when crossing the road, and um, a lot of their habitat is being destroyed right now, which is unfortunate. Um, but another thing, which is really not that great for the environment, is that these little red-eared sliders are something called invasive species. So people get these little turtles and they're about the size of a toonie. And people don't realize these are gonna live many, many years with you. <laughs> and they're gonna grow quite large. This is one of our smaller turtles. We have even bigger turtles in the back and they need big tanks and lots of lights and filters and things like that. So some people release them into the wild. and. So they've become invasive species in some areas and um, it's unfortunate, but they're not meant to be in the wild. And I don't think little Almira could survive out there either. <laughs> um, I'm looking at other questions. Vanessa says, I've always wanted turtles, but heard they're a high maintenance. They are Vanessa, very high maintenance. Um, we love our girls here so much. And when we had school groups on site, the students would get to see the turtles and touch a turtle and it was really a great experience for them. Um, but if you can see the tank behind me, it is huge. And we have to light everything for their shells so that their shells grow properly. It has a massive filter underneath that stinks when you clean it out, it smells. <laughs> and it's just a really mucky job cleaning them out. We love them, but they are a lot of maintenance. So um, I recommend doing research before you get one. And I will say, if you do want to get one, um, I recommend always adopting. There are turtles that are up for adoption. Um, at different places in Ontario. So um, check those places out as well. Um, Nancy's asking, can I keep them? Sure, here you go, Nancy, come and take one. <laughs> I think Banzi asked for one too before. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, take one. Um, no, we love them all. We could never give them away. <laughs> uh, Nancy, I'm first. <laughs> <laughs> You're first in line? Yeah, I'm first in line. <laughs> You want them for uh, 10 years, 20 years, Banzi? <laughs> I mean, yes, but I'm also worried because they are, I mean, high maintenance. Like They're a lot of work, um, but we love every second of it. And um, all of the students that come here and visit them, they love our turtles, so we could never give them away. <laughs> um, somebody asked, is having a turtle the same as having a tortoise? Um, that's a good question. Tortoises are mostly terrestrial. Um, so they need more land and turtles really like a lot of water. As you can see, we need a big tank with water, but also, also sites for them to bask on as well. And you can see, I'll turn my, uh, my camera a little bit here. This is a nesting box. So a lot of times once they uh, reach the age of maturity, they're just like chickens, well, which they'll um, lay eggs, even if they don't have a mate. And so you have to provide them with a nesting box so that they can dig around in the soil and lay some eggs in there too. Uh, Lucy says she has this type of turtle over 40 years old now. Wow, 
That's awesome. Good for you. Good for you. It's a lot of work. I'm sure Lucy is nodding her head to everything I'm saying right now. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, we have eight turtle species here in Ontario, and they're all waking up from their long hibernation right now, um, which is exciting. We can go out and see them again. Um, but they are struggling a lot with road mortality. So that's something that um, if you are driving mostly in Northern Ontario or on side roads in Southern Ontario, um, you'll see these little turtles crossing the road. So um, one thing I'd say is just do a little bit of research on how you can help them safely cross the road. Um, that'd be great for all of our populations um, to last a little bit longer with us. And I see in the Q&A, Adam has asked, how old are the turtles? So um, the oldest one we have in the tank is about 40 years old. The other ones, I'm not too sure. Um, I think they're anywhere from 25 to, to 35. The other ones that are smaller, but our largest turtle right here, which is Lady um, swimming right here, she is uh, about 40 years old. Now, um, just to end it off, I think I'm gonna put them in the tank and we're gonna give them a little bit of food and watch them eat for a bit. And if anyone has any other questions, please type them in the chat now before we head out. Um, questions about turtles or questions for any of our speakers from Peel Psychology as well. I'm sure they'll be able to answer them. You can just type them um, in the Q&A option. You should have both like the chat and the Q&A. So feel free to type it anywhere. <laughs> So what I'm feeding right now are just some sticks. Um, this is like, like a cheeseburger for a human. Um, they don't eat these all the time. Uh, it's full of nutrients and good stuff for them, but we like to feed them lots of veggies too. I love the comparison, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I wonder, maybe I can bring you guys a little bit closer. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Do they have a little ramp in there? Am I seeing that? Yeah, they do. Um, so they have a basking spot right up here with a light. And then this way, this ramp goes up to their nesting box that they go in. Oh, wow. oh okay. Oh, it's very neat. And they have a little fish friend in there as well. Um, so that is to keep them occupied. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's so much fun to watch them eat. And you can see this one that's in the middle of the screen right now, that's Lady. You can see how large she is. Stephanie, yeah. there's a question. Yep. Um, it says, how long, so Judy asks, how long can they stay underwater before they need to come up for air? That is a good question, Judy, and one that I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm sure it's several minutes. Um, but I do know that throughout the winter time, they stay underwater for months. So when they go into hibernation, they slow down their breathing and their heart rate, and they sit at the bottom of lakes for months without coming up for air. And how they do this is actually there is um, H2O, which is water, has a little bit of oxygen in it. And around their tails or their bum, they have these little tiny, um, cells like specialized cells that suck in water and they take the little bit of oxygen out of the water and that's how they actually keep oxygen running in their body they they take it from the water um so i always say it's so funny because when you're swimming around in a lake you never think about that but next time you're swimming in a lake think about where it might have been <laughs> um so i think is there any other questions coming in? Let me just check Facebook and see if there's any questions there as well. Um, other than that, I think that is good. I, I want to just say thank you to Juliana, Rushi, and Banzi. Um, great presentation. It was so much fun and relaxing. Um, and uh, it was just wonderful to connect with you guys and do this workshop. And I hope that we do another one in the future as well. Um, I think we will. And if you have any suggestions for things that you wanna see in the future or things that you want us to talk about, you can write them in the in the chat before you go. Oh, and that's perfect. Thanks, Bansy, for doing that. 
Um, and there is all of our emails and our websites as well that you can visit us and learn a little bit more about the Riverwood Conservancy and Peel Psychology and Therapy Center. But I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Happy Friday. I hope everyone gets outside or comes to Riverwood um, or does a Rushi's awesome turtle craft. All of this is recorded, so it will go back online and you can do that with your kids or by yourself too. So I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, everyone, so Thank much. You. It's been lots of fun tonight. Yeah. Okay. Have a good weekend, everyone. Stay safe. Hopefully, get outside. It's supposed to be nice and sunny tomorrow. So. Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.